Hello and welcome, everybody. It's 3 p.m. Eastern on a Wednesday, so this is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer. We're with Artist Network, and we are here to draw live together. So what we do every week is we find a new subject, a new reference image to work from, and we identify specific ways that we can grow by using that as, as a subject matter for our drawing. So we're going to tackle this subject today here, this portrait. Uh, if you want to follow along, you'll find a link to the reference in the description below, where you'll also find a link to the materials. Um, so I'll go over the materials quickly, uh, but I just want to shout out to everybody. Thank you for joining. And if you are new, I'd love to hear where you are viewing from. Um, and I want to welcome you. We This is episode, what, 144. So we've been doing a lot of these and we've done multiple portraits. And I, I feel like I'm st slowly kind of getting better with them. So hopefully you are as well. Um, if you have any questions, comments, you know, alternative ways of thinking about drawing, you know, really any thoughts about art making in general, this is a, a very safe place to do that. So please use the chat for that, and I will do my best to monitor as we go along. So again, this is the portrait that we're working on. Um, I, I completed this in charcoal, but I think this would actually translate very well to graphite as well. So if you don't have the same materials, that's totally fine. Uh, so let's take a look at the materials that I'm working with. So this is the cotton rag paper, my Reeves BFK. Um, I'll be working in charcoal. So I have, it's really simple today. So I've just got my vine charcoal. I have uh, a hard compressed charcoal pencil as well as a soft. So this is the, the Faber-Castell pit and then the General's charcoal is extra soft. I love both of those brands and I just like to have a variety of hard and soft. Um, for blending, I have now this new tool added to the toolbox, this uh, Dynasty IPC1 blending brush, as well as a new quarter-inch uh, Tortillon blending stump. And then my erasers, my trusty Derwent retractable eraser, of course, which I have um, shaved down into this chisel tip to give me some precision, as well as this really old needed eraser that I, I think I need to replace now because it's getting kind of sticky. So um, we'll get to it. And then I want to address um, your comments, Jackie. So I'm just using the vine charcoal here and I'm going to uh, establish a quick gesture. Uh, and uh, Jackie, your question uh, was why do we age our portraits? And while I don't have a scientific answer and it's not one that I've really studied a whole lot the but my my suspicion is that it has to do in general with kind of overstating the features of something that I've had to really manage in my own portrait work is being just more delicate with my marks than um, you know than I tend to be and so and I think that tends to add to the age um, but Again, that's not necessarily a fully formed uh, kind of opinion, but it's something to think about. And we'll talk about edge work here throughout this process. Um, so this gesture, you, know, you might notice it might be a little bit different than what you might have you know, kind of learned as a gesture. Um, if you've taken a beginning drawing course, often we think of a gesture as being something that's linear, uh, uh, which is certainly the case, but I also refer to that a gesture is something that can be based on shape and mass. And that's what I'm working on now. So these initial marks that I'm making are simple reactions to the form. I'm letting my eyes lose focus. I'm maybe squinting them to try to simplify the, the reference image. And I'm using the very small thumbnail on a screen in front of me. I'm seeing what you're seeing. Um, so making it small and squinting my eyes helps me to see the large shapes. See it as an abstraction, as a collection of shapes, uh, rather than be absorbed in all the detail that is uh, so seductive. With the vine charcoal too, it's a really nice soft uh, material that I can use to kind of just build a layer on the surface of the paper. It's going to make the compressed charcoal a little bit more receptive overall. So with these initial gestures, it's not about getting the marks accurate. It's about just getting marks on the page, about connecting your mind and your hand, building up that hand-eye coordination. And it's about kind of slowly getting into the pace of drawing. 
So I'm just reacting to the form. And as I'm building up these marks, now I start to have things on the page that I can react to. Um, the What I'm going to try to do my best today and is to try to break down the portrait drawing process into distinct steps. These are the steps that I use to navigate a portrait. And they may be different for you, but I think in general, we all make the same types of decisions when we draw, what we do is play around with the order at which we apply those decisions and ask those things. So I like to start with a gesture. Um, one of the things it also allows me to do is to initiate the drawing from a point of unity on the page. You know, it's very little, there are very few divisions on the surface of the page. You can see I'm blending with my, just the palm of my hand, it's a little less oily. Um, if you have a paper towel, that also works really well. So I'm not going to smooth this out. I'm not pressing too hard because I don't want to really embed the the charcoal. Um, let me see. What size is the paper? Leslie is asking. This is about nine by eleven and a half. Um, so the size of the reference photo is about an eight by ten. So I just scaled it up just slightly from that. Um, it's good to see where everybody is viewing from. Uh, Mad Moments Go, I see you just finished your iguana drawing. I've seen a lot of really great drawings this week, and now I haven't had a chance to respond to them all, but uh, fantastic work. Um, and yeah, it looks like we get people from all over. Peter is asking, is it important to make your portrait your own look or draw every detail? Um, the, that is a good question. And I think the only one that can really answer that is you. But I'm really glad that you asked that question right up front because it's something that I feel is important to get some sort of clarity in your mind as you initiate the drawing. Having that target in mind, the threshold in terms of accuracy, you know, whether you want it to be more expressive or more descriptive, uh, whether you want it to make more of a caricature, uh, whether you want it to be more serious, all of those things, if you have a vision for that going into the drawing, it'll help you to stay focused. Um, I don't know as if there really is a right way and a right decision to make with regards to that. Um, I, th this is probably going to fall somewhere in the middle more uh, on the side of accuracy than expression and um, kind of artistic freedom. But... The, I, mean, I think, like I said, it, it, that's just my natural proclivity here. Um, and you may find a lot of value in trying to deviate from it. Uh, the goal, the, the, really the ultimate thing is, is what can you learn from your drawing? Um, and what would you like to learn in this experience today? Um, all right. So with just kind of a rough kind of value, kind of patchy, abstraction here, I can start to layer on some of my measuring, measurements. So I move from gesture being stage one into measuring, um, into refinement, and then into finishing details or the kind of the, the texture. Uh, and that's what I actually, this is, this is, it kind of comes from the book. You can see I actually have, um, I, had, I broke down a portrait in here very similarly. Where is she? Um, she should be there. She is, but very similarly, you know, starting with the reference image, uh, creating a gesture, moving into measurement, uh, and we're going to apply some of the tools from this. And so the what I'm what I'm trying to do again is is to create um, some structure around the process and helping you decide when to use certain techniques and hopefully slow things down if you're feeling overwhelmed by so many things that you need to pay attention to when you're drawing. If we break it down into distinct steps, we can we can say, all right, that now the gesture is established, we can kind of set that aside. Let's just focus on measurement now and not think about too many other things at this point. And once that's done, we can move on to the next stage. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of establish the a, a point for the top of the head and i am going to just eyeball it right now and using the vine charcoal it's fairly light 
you can see how easily I can remove some of those marks. Um, I like to start with angle sighting first. And what that is, is I'm really just looking at the, the main angles that I'm observing. If I can think of this as an abstraction um, and not get kind of sucked into any of the details at this early stage, I can just focus on breaking down these curves into simple straight edges. Um, and this is really kind of just in response where I'm looking at the reference to the left, looking at the drawing adjacent to it, and just looking back and forth to see if it feels right. Now one way to double check this as well is to close one eye so that it flattens your depth perception. And if you hold your pencil out or charcoal in front of you and you place it so that it looks like it's directly on top of your reference, and this, this works really effectively for drawing from life as well, you find the angle that you're targeting, lock your wrist, and then carry your hand across until it aligns with your drawing. So in this case, if I'm looking at this angle that represents the left side of her cheek there, I find the angle, carry that across, and then I can make some adjustments from there. And I'm keeping these marks really light at this point um, because how we manage the edges will affect things like, like Jackie, your, your comment about aging the portrait. Okay, so angle sighting becomes one tool. Uh, and again, this at this point, I'm just kind of eyeballing it. Um, as I move through the portrait, then I will start to apply some additional measurement to it. Now, one of the things as, I, as I'm moving through, and again, I'm just being kind of gestural with these marks, is I'm trying to look for relationships in the drawing. Uh, so this is a great way to apply plumb lines and horizontal guides. So what a plumb line is, is a vertical path that passes through multiple elements of your subject. So for example, if we look at the hand here for kind of estimating the shape of the hand, um, we can find it's the, you know, the right side of the hand where the, the fingertips are. We can visualize a, a line that runs vertically through the figure, through the reference. And what I see is that it, it would, it's directly in line with the nose, and then the eyes are to, to the side of that. Um, and, it, and it kind of aligns with the central axis of the head. Um, quick shout out to everybody. I see a lot of new, uh, some new names here, people from viewing from all over. This is great. Um, lollipop. I also use a, yeah, I do use a paper towel mostly for blending. Some people use a chamois cloth. That, that works really well also. Um, I just don't have one, so I tend to use paper towels. Easier to find. Um, let's see. Uh, it, also, horizontal guides can be really helpful. So if you imagine, so for example, here's kind of a landmark, a place where the ear intersects with the neck. If I run a line horizontally across there, I can see at which point it intersects that cheek. And so far it's feeling, feeling pretty good. And so with, with these early marks, again, I'm focusing on large areas first and then gradually just getting smaller and smaller. And that's the general process for drawing. Uh, one of the things I like to keep in mind and I like to have running through my, my mind as I work is try to, try to work as though every mark is a gesture, you know, that all drawing is gesture drawing. It's just a matter of scale. So we start with large gestures here, moving in to increasingly smaller gestures as we refine the drawing. And what that helps me to do is think of my marks as, as really having a degree of permanence to them or intention behind them, that uh, every mark we make can be descriptive of something. You know, as I'm filling in the background here, um, you know, there are some marks that aren't all that gestural, but um, 
I want to just kind of that, that's one of my loose rules that I have, the little mantras that I have running through my mind is, is how can I make this drawing express the idea that every mark is a gesture? Um, okay. Now let's see. I'm going to compare some additional marks. Uh, I think I'd need to erase this out, do some subtractive drawing a little bit. Oh, this paper is not... Oh, yeah, I know why. I grabbed the wrong paper. This is not the Reeves BFK. This, based on how it feels, I believe is the Pesha. But fear not, we'll make it work. It's not releasing the, the, the um, charcoal as much as I'd like. But I can, I can lift some. We'll be all right. I don't need to have super intense highlights. Or I can just darken everything down. Oop, wrong one. Okay. Now, and you can see that I, I haven't worked with the facial features. This is just my process in this on this particular drawing. I could have ju just as easily started with placing the the features and then building out from it. I kind of move back and forth, and, and I don't know as if one way is any better than the others. Um, I had heard that you know, uh, Sargent, for example, when he would make his portraits, would actually start with something like this, start with a, a rough kind of oval-shaped form and then gradually refine it. Um, you know, some artists will, again, work from the center outward. Some will work from the outside, out, the outer dimensions inward. The challenge here, though, from past experience, what I've, what I've learned is that I have a bias towards making the head wider than it actually is. So I need to compare the width to the height. So I'm going to use my comparative measuring to do that. So if I close one eye, flatten my depth perception, actually I'm going to use this pencil which is a little bit more visible, I'm aligning this edge of the pencil with this part of her cheekbone, the farthest cheekbone kind of point on the reference photo, sliding this finger down until it aligns with this right side of the ear. That gives me the width measurement, and I can simply rotate my wrist, and now take a measurement from the chin upward. And let me take that again. I'm gonna do that multiple times. And what I see is roughly a, a proportion of one to one and a third. So what I see is that I've drawn this too wide. So if I take this measurement of the width and compare it to the height from the chin upward, that measurement, that means this mark right here, should be about where her the eyebrow on the left, on the right is, her left eyebrow is. And that doesn't leave me a whole lot of room for the forehead. So what that tells me is that I can make some adjustments. I don't want to go much larger. I want to keep plenty of space here. Um, so if I keep the if I keep the height consistent, what it tells me is that I need to have a width that's about this. You see how much narrower I need to go, and I'll probably need to come in of equidistant on, on the left and the right sides. And if I if I kind of hold that in my mind a bit as I work down this uh, this path here, I'm going to take another stab at kind of capturing the, the angles here. And so I think it can be really helpful to become aware of your natural biases, like the things that I have to overcome 
in my drawings, they, they, they repeat themselves and it can get frustrating at times, but um, it also, um, it can be uh, a part of your kind of signature. We talked about this before, but one of the ways that you can authenticate a historic drawing is um, you can look at the types of corrections an artist makes in their work. So if you can see that an artist has moved a line from one spot to another, that uh, if you see a consistency between that and other drawings that you know belong to that artist, uh, it can be another um, another indicator that you actually have a work by that specific artist. So there's a great documentary out about where uh, a work presumed to be by uh, Leonardo da Vinci is being evaluated, and that's one of the things that is being looked at is where are where are the corrections and is that fairly consistent? Okay. Uh, now let's, let's see if I have that measurement a bit better. And I feel like that is better, much better. I'm going to find the general axis for the eyes. I'm going to find the central axis, which kind of curves. So I'll find an angle for that. So I break that central axis down into two lines, one that runs from the, the tip of the nose up to the hairline, and then one that runs from the base of the nose down through the lips into the chin. Um, what is the easier way to measure when you're drawing a face of a man or a woman? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I think that starts to become a, a, a kind of unique to you as the artist. Uh, and you're going to find some tools some tools for measuring that you kind of intuitively understand better than others. Um, I, I kind of rely on angle sighting. I feel like that solves a lot of problems, but you can see here that um, I really needed to measure the, I mean, the, the ultimate guide though will be your own judgment. I mean, I think becoming um, attuned to um, kind of becoming attuned to certain aspects of proportion and correcting measurements can be really helpful. And um, by going through the exercises of trying all of these techniques, um, then I think it can help you to say, all right, something is off. And you may not know what that is until you go through the process of measuring. Uh, but, you know, simply becoming kind of intuitively aware of that something is off is really an important step. Um, you know, I think if I were to say, like, if I could, if I had to complete a drawing and I could only use one tool for measuring, I would say plumb lines and guides. So, being able to visualize across the drawing and then down vertically is really an important thing. It helps you to really understand the whole of the drawing by making connections both laterally and, and vertically throughout the drawing, um, really visualizing you know, how each element relates to another. And having that, it's a great way to keep that mindset going. Okay. So I'm just kind of establishing some rough shapes here. Now, at this stage, I find it helpful to, to not think of the features as, you know, lip, as lips, nose, mouth, etc. Try to think of them just as shapes, if you can. Squinting your eyes really helps. Uh, 
Um, and I'm, you can see that I just jumped back and forth between working with the lips to the, the eyebrows here. And part of that is intentional because I'm trying to make those connections across the drawing. And, and so the other thing that, you know, to go back to your earlier question, Jackie, about aging the portrait, um, you can see I'm really trying to be delicate with the features here. You know, use very soft lines and think about it in terms of light and shadow first. You know, if I overstate a line, that's going to initially age the portrait because it just enhances, you know, a, a crease or something like that in the, in the head. So um, something to think about there. Um, now, as I move through, I want to start to visualize the this shadow shape. So uh, we, we've we've talked about this in, in previous episodes, but I think there there it becomes relevant here to think about uh, multiple ways of considering the shadow. So we have here visible a the form shadow, we can see that there's a light side and a shadow side of the head. Um, it is also casting a shadow underneath the, the chin there. And when you combine that form shadow and the cast shadow, you develop what's called the shadow shape. Um, and that's where I want to be thinking about now. And I want to be kind of visualizing that the general axis for what's called the line of termination, or the terminator, as it's sometimes called, the idea that that's the, the point at which, on a rounded form, it moves from being struck by light into shadow. And it's often a very kind of diffuse mark. And you can see here, there's more diffusion along this part. It becomes a little bit sharper in here. Um, a kind of a sharper edge up around the eyes and then more diffused again in the, sh in the, the forehead. And so that's something that we'll continue to refine as well. Um, let me see here. I might continue to make adjustments. So squinting the eyes, one of the other things I want to do is start to darken the background here. And again, this is just with the vine charcoal, so all of this is going to be easily washed away. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a nice little fingerprint there. That's pretty awesome. I love those things. When a, when a blemish in the drawing shows up. All right, so let me get. I'm going to kind of move back to that that termination. That line of termination seems to kind of follow this path here. It kind of it changes direction here, up the cheekbone, then back along this ridge along the cheekbone. And then it's hard to know where it, where it is here. It's so diffused. All right. And I'm actually going to, I'm not worried about any of this being permanent because, again, this is the vine charcoal. Um, and that's now I think we can start to move into the next step. Um, Stephanie's saying eyebrow to top of ear is receding. Yes. Um, and so that, what you're talking about uh, is this, this understanding the depth this way um, to really push that ear back. Because what can happen um, in, in a portrait, especially when, we, when we're 
where we're transitioning from this really two-dimensional phase in the drawing into something that is more three-dimensional, our brain really struggles with that transition sometimes. And what can happen is we know that there is a distance between them and there's a lot of information there. Um, and we, we tend to kind of exaggerate some of those things and it, it kind of throws off our understanding of the, the lateral distance. Um, Greg is saying fingerprints on the drawings drive me nuts. I imagine with your work it does. <laughs> yeah, that has got to be a very big challenge. Um, all right, so, all right, so now wiping down again. Um, I'm going to move into the next phase, which is kind of refining the the large shapes, especially the shadow shape. Now I'm going to use the harder graphite. Uh, and I'm actually going to continue to angle site here. You know, I, I, I'm not following, you know, the, the previous lines that I had. You know, I'm using those previous lines to build an experience that I can rely on. Um, and, and I'm redrawing that. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, this is just, a, it's an entirely new attempt. And I'm still letting my eyes lose focus uh, so that I can see this through blurred vision and, and see the overall shapes better. Um, but what I'm trying to do now is just arrive at kind of a clearer shape using the compressed charcoal, which is a little bit more permanent. Uh, and this is going to move me you know, closer to in the final stage. So each of these stages that I break it down, again, the four primary steps, starting from gesture into measuring, into uh, refining the large shapes, and then into final details. Um, each, each one I find I spend a little bit more time with, but I think the in general, this third phase is where I spend most of my time. Uh, you know, so the gesture is pretty quick. And if I'm just focusing on measuring, I can move through that pretty quickly. Uh, and if I spend enough time in this third phase of really refining the big shapes, it makes the addition of the, the texture and other refinements uh, quite a bit easier. So uh, this is where I, I, most of the drawing really lives. Uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about as well is moving back and forth between the positive space and the negative space. So as I'm laying on this uh, this compressed charcoal here, and I'm refining some of these forms. You can see here where I'm laying down the darks, I am building up that shadow shape in the ear. So actually on the figure, but as I move to this side of the head, what I'm actually doing is refining that background, working up to the edge. And I have to be really careful with my marks. I just want to make sure that I'm building up, building up enough hatching that there's no kind of dominant direction in the marks. And if there is a dominant direction, I want that to be something that uh, interacts with the edge of the head at a bit of an angle. I don't want it to parallel the edge of the head because that'll end up flattening the, the space in the drawing. What it does is it tells the viewer that if the marks here run parallel to the head, if they're running in the same direction, they must belong together. And so then it brings that background to the same plane as that head. If you change the direction of the marks, it becomes another cue to the eye that says, or those are, those must be different things. Um, so as I move down here, actually, I'm going to soften this a little bit. I'm using this overhand grip intentionally. Um, because it allows me to create both a, a sharp and precise edge as well as lay it down into a, uh, a, a like a more broad mark. And as I look down this cheek, I can see that it's really a diffused edge. And so I want to keep that in mind, um, really playing on that contrast in sharpness between this area here where it's a sharper edge into this which is more diffused and now as we come down uh, and, and follow even farther down the the length of the head here 
Now we switch again, we pivot again to where the dark marks represent the, the, uh, the cheek there. It's actually darker on the cheek than it is in, in the chin than it is in that background. I want to get, I want to double check the angle of her chin. So what I'm seeing is in general a perspective. Um, if we think about the chin, the mouth, the nose, and the eyes as falling along horizontal axes, we can apply linear perspective to that. Um, so what I see is in general the nose, if we connect the two nostril points across here, is pretty much horizontal. And as we move up, the axis of the eyes becomes a little bit slanted as though it's moving down towards a point on the, this horizon line here. And as we move down from there, the, the, the mouth actually has got a bit of a slant, which is kind of interesting. But then the, the overall axis to the chin kind of comes down a little bit. And if we were to imagine an axis here for the top of the forehead, there's, there's a bit of a slope there as well. Actually, I want to get rid of that, though. So as we, as we look down in this portion of the drawing, I'm actually feathering, feathering into the lips, into the shadow here on the chin. And I'm going to deal with this shadow shape a little bit later. Uh, and I'm preferring to continue to work with some of the, the darker areas first. Um, you know, so I'm going to continue to add uh, charcoal before I start lifting and subtracting from the drawing just to keep pushing the, the overall key of the drawing downward into the dark areas. Uh, I'm going to feather this background out a little bit. And as I'm building up these layers in the background, uh, one of the things that I'm doing is rolling the pencil as I go so that it continues to round out the pencil, not developing any flat spots on that lead, or the, the core. Uh, and if, by squinting my eyes, I can start to identify areas that are a little bit light, and then I target those. So if I'm looking for a smooth gradation, targeting the, the light areas, maybe switching to the circular mark, filling those in, and then kind of feathering out. Uh, and I'm also holding in my mind that I can go darker in value with this. So even if my mind is starting to calibrate to these values and thinking of this as, as black, uh, I, I need to keep in mind that I can actually go quite a bit darker when I bring in the soft uh, charcoal. I had moments go. I hate when I show my drawings and people <laughs> will touch or rub the drawing. Yeah, that's a uh, that's got to be frustrating. Um, let's see. Tammy say I'm just not that great with portraits, which is why I should be doing this right. Exactly. I, I I about once a year, I challenge myself with a self portrait, and. It is an incredibly humbling experience. <laughs> it's, I really struggle with them. Um, and I really struggled with portraits, you know, when we started up the show. I just did, I have avoided portraits for so long because um, I, I just know that I, I become kind of blind to certain things. I haven't really created portraits enough to, 
to really get good the way some of these these great portrait artists are. Uh, so as you know, for the next Illuminate program, uh, Illuminate is a a, a series of live events that we host on Artist Network uh, for for members. And for the next one we do, uh, we'll actually be um, I'll be talking with Gustavo Ramos, who's a he's a young painter. Just it's hard to describe how beautiful his portraits are. You know, he's it, very kind of well classically trained, and I'm very much looking forward to talking with him. Um, I typically kind of navigate towards landscapes because I just like being in the landscape and I enjoy, I don't know, that becomes a little bit more forgiving <laughs> than a portrait. You can be off on a landscape a bit more, more expressive. And I don't know, we, we just apply so much to a portrait. We want it to look so good. Um, all right, so I needed to take some time to fill in that background to help build up, just start to, to think through some of these value relationships. Um, paper towel here, starting with a light pressure and these circular motions, I'm just going to try to evenly blend it. And go right over that edge. I'm not worried about preserving the edges of the, the head too much. And I find that it all blends a little bit more easily because of that layer of uh, uh, vine charcoal that we started with in the gesture. Um, Heather's asking, how do I set up my self-portraits? Uh, I do them with a mirror. I didn't do one last year, did I? Um, I'm just kind of thinking out loud. I don't remember doing one last year. Um, but I do it with a mirror, and I typically don't show it to anybody because they're. Uh, I haven't steeled my ego enough for that yet, um, and I've learned from past experience that when I'm, I, I'll get that that feeling of pride. I'm like, I really nailed this portrait. I can't wait to show it, and I show it to the person, and I immediately see the proportions are off. It doesn't look like me. <laughs> so um, it's, I, it, for me, it's purely an exercise. Um, be, and it, it, it is not just in terms of techniques, but also um, I, I think, it, or even more so, again, a, a kind of that, that opportunity to, to help me get my, get my head straight about the whole process and that and be comfortable with it not going great <laughs> so hopefully that makes sense um yeah i just know some people that do amazing self-portraits and uh all right so just using the paper towel trying to be intentional with some of the um, the marks that I'm making here and just thinking through that transition between light and shadow. Now, one of the things that um, you may notice in this portrait is the fall off in terms of the light. And this is typically true with, with most portraits. Because most portraits are lit from above, we typically see more light, you know, striking up there in the forehead and along the cheekbones, maybe the tip of the nose. And then as we, as we come down, the, the lighter areas are not nearly as bright as what we see here. So everything shifts down in value as we start to kind of round down. Um, so I, I want to be kind of aware of that moving into it and start from a point of of thinking about that. And that's something that I learned from Christy Gordon. She's got a really great portrait course on Artist Network that um, I helped film with her, and I learned a lot about portraiture from that. And you can see that on the hand as well. If you squint your eyes um, and you 
and you fix your gaze down here, but put your awareness on the highlight, you can see how much brighter that highlight is, right? So I can get quite a bit darker down in here. And, and so at this early stage, continuing to try to isolate that. Now I lost some of the refinement of this edge here. I'm gonna use these circular marks as I kind of, as I feather away from that edge. Um, and then continue to refine down in here. switch to that overhand grip a bit more. And so I do have a larger scale reference to my left here, but I'm not using that at this point. I'm still using the small thumbnail. Uh, and I need that um, because uh, it, I get, it. it's just too seductive. I get too pulled into the details, the features, too early if I use that larger reference. So I need to keep using the smaller thumbnail until I really build up a structure of light and shadow. Um, so I'm really trying to change up the direction of my marks as I refine this shadow shape. Um, looking back and forth between the photo and the reference. I can continue to refine it, but I do think I need to kind of adjust here a little bit. So if I'm using my eraser to sharpen up an edge, I'm starting with the lightest pressure possible. And you can see I'm using this kind of um, circular motion because I don't want to lift off too much. You know, this, even though it gets lighter back in here, it's not anywhere near as light as uh, the the highlight on the cheek, so I just need to be really careful. So kind of just like it, like I was when I was drawing with the charcoal, really light pressure. Kind of moving, working up to that edge, and then feathering away. Um, yeah, self-portrait definitely is scary. That's a, and that was a really good tip, um, Stephanie. If anybody hasn't read that about, you know, really kind of squaring up and looking at the slant between the eyes and the ear. Um, you know, this is, and this is where I, you know, there, there are a lot of different methods for teaching portrait drawing. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I've, I've tried many, um, you know, there are many quote unquote rules for portraiture and the idea that the, the eyes typically fall in the middle of the head, that the, the eyes are generally in line with the top of the ear. Um, but I also just, I, I, I want to be careful of that because the in this case, as Stephanie's pointing out, there's a, a tilt to the head that may not be initially apparent, um, but it's really seeing the distinct angle, the distinct slope between the eyes and the ear that um, that makes that that visible. And so, um, and if I were thinking in my head, oh, the, the eyes must be in line with the top of the ear, then um, I could end up missing that, and it, something would feel off. And so you can see I'm, I'm just keep working that edge until I find something that I'm, I'm happy with. Um, 
And as I moved it through here, I'm seeing subtle variations in the value in that shadow. Um, and what I'm going for is an average value here. So, um, if I bring my eyes into focus, I see some beautiful reflected light. But I'm not going to address that at this point. I'm going to be thinking about the average value. And if squinting my eyes helps me to see that. And when I squint my eyes, that reflected light along here disappears. So I don't want to indicate that. And now there's a, this is a really interesting um, shape here. So we see a soft edge up here from the chin. Um, we see a hard edge on the bottom side of the chin. And we see a hard edge here on the, the left of the neck. I don't know, looking at just that, that collar there, trying to find that shape in relation to the ear. Um, one of the things that can be helpful is to see that negative space in there. Um, this is, and I can refine this shape of the light on the sweater just by erasing off a little bit. So squinting my eyes too, what happens is that this all becomes kind of a soft shadow. So I'm using these really light circular marks as just the weight of the pencil at this point, building up some of that tone. And what my goal is in this is to be thinking about the shapes of light and shadow, not about the features. So squinting, I see a, a kind of a, a really soft transition of values in through here, through this area. And I'm you know, intentionally saying in through here in this area because I don't want to call them lips. I don't want to call it chin, nose, etc. I just want to think about it as just a shape. And that shape doesn't really have a name. It's not a square, it's not a circle, etc. Um, I'm just trying to lock onto that shape and represent it as best as I can. Uh, now, we've talked about the the role that an anatomical understanding can play in your work. Uh, and I think that, you know, the more you understand anatomy, the, the greater depth um, of experience you'll be able to create for yourself. Um, but at the same time, I also feel like if you don't have that anatomical understanding, you can simply rely on these drawing tools and thinking about these as abstractions, and you'll arrive at a, a competent portrait. Uh, the idea is if you if you pay close attention to edges and value relationships and, and shapes, um, then they will express the, the structure of the head as well. But again, I think having an anatomical understanding can um, lead to a richer experience overall and, and potentially lead to a stronger drawing. It helps you just become aware of things that you might overlook otherwise. All right, there's like an interesting angle here, just on the hairline. One of the other things too about the hairline is that it's much softer than it might feel otherwise. Um, so just be mindful of that. So for example, it's a softer edge here. 
a little bit harder up here. Um, we turn into shadow right in through here. And then, but the, the edge becomes a little bit visible as well where the hair kind of lays more flat on the surface there of the, of the head. Kind of getting in the way of my own observations there. Okay, so um, I may, for the purposes of this drawing, forego the hands today, just because, just depending on time. So I'm going to make sure that we get a bulk of the, the bulk of the portrait established. Um, but uh, we'll see how far we get. So just another pass with the the paper towel here. Really kind of soften that edge. And I'm trying to make even these broad blending um, swipes here. I'm trying to make a statement with each one of those. Um, and I haven't used the blending stump yet, but I do need to bring that out. I just realized that my blending stump is new, and that could cause me trouble. I need to make it nice and built up. Uh, so I need to just pick up some material here with my blending stump. So as I'm using the blending stump, I'm rolling it in my fingers just to create even deposits on the paper, not using a heavy pressure, it's pretty light, because um, it, it, it can really kind of impress on the paper and, and push that charcoal into it in a way that may not be very helpful. All right, so this is where the, I really love working with a blending stump. Um, I'm going to yeah, and, and again, my eyes are really softly focused. I'm trying to just see basic shapes here. It looks kind of strange now because her lips have largely just disappeared. Um, but that's okay. I want to be thinking about this in terms of the, of light and that transition from light into shadow. So with this blending stump, I can also start to create more refined marks here. And I like to use my blending stump to or my tortillon to um, uh, to indicate the facial features because they are a bit more gentle. Uh, and again, this goes kind of goes back to that question that you had earlier, Jackie, about aging the portrait. Um, I find that by drawing more with this blending stump, I can indicate lines a little bit more more effectively. Uh, if I if I were to indicate, for example, this crease here, this line, with the with compressed charcoal right out of the gate, it could be a little heavy, and it's going to make her feel older than she actually is. So my goal is to first kind of refine these shapes. And I'm seeing here, and. Uh, I can start to think through the structure, 
see where the turn in the head is happening. So we have the, if we have a front plane here for the head, it changes direction into another plane that starts to angle back, back again as it rounds around. And we see kind of a, a frontal plane here along the cheek that makes a turn back towards the ear. Um, let's see, I think I want to kind of soften this edge. And I'm not thinking about final value relationships or vi final values here. I'm mostly thinking about edges at this stage. Um, when I'm working here, that on this side of what will become the nose, I'm trying to think of the direction that I want to make my mark, something that can help to reinforce that structure. Let me see if I can just kind of refine this shape a little bit more. Uh, I need to kind of clarify that edge just a little bit. Um, before I start to make marks where the eyes will be, I just want to be careful that I'm in the right spot um, and that, that I'm mindful of this lateral relationship between them. Uh, let's see here. So again, my, my primary concern is of that, what's happening in terms of light and shadow, not about the features. I'll, I wanna drop the features into those shadows. How are we doing on time? Yeah, so we're about an hour in. Um, I'm just gonna keep focusing on the face and the head. And if I have any extra time, I'll work on the hands, but. Okay. Um, uh, Tammy's saying I bought some Bickford, uh, uh, Bockingford uh, watercolor paper, not cotton, but charcoal and graphite should work on it, don't you think? Um, if you have a scrap, I would give it a shot. I've had mixed results drawing on watercolor paper. Um, sometimes it really holds the material. Uh, so you just want to make sure that when you lay down the material, the, the charcoal or the graphite that you're able to lift it again with the eraser. All right, so now you can see I kind of sharpened that. It's a little bit heightened in terms of that value relationship, but I'm gonna keep it. It feels kind of reminiscent of something that uh, Rembrandt would do. All right, so as I work up on this edge, I'm using my sharpened eraser. Um, and if we think back a few weeks to the uh, the drawing of the pots, that you actually can see it right over my shoulder here on the black paper, we spent a lot of time talking about the turning edge. Um, so the idea that uh, there's, you know, we really want to wrap our marks around the edges. Uh, so as we, as I look at this section here, um, I want to be mindful of the value here versus the highlight here, especially on the nose that's right next to it, that this is quite a bit darker than that highlight. So I don't want to lift off too much. I just want to sharpen that edge. So as a result, I'm being really delicate with the eraser and trying to blend with it at the same time. You can see it's picking up material here. Um, and so I can... Um, I can just move it around a little bit. Um, and if I need to, I can be gentle and, and kind of knock down the value a touch um, without you kind know, of degrading that edge too much. Um, and the same thing happens here. 
it gets a little bit sharper on that edge, but I don't want to erase down to that bright white. I just want a sharper edge with a slightly darker value. Um, and by thinking that way, my hope is that it's going to create more form and volume for the, for the head. So, and I can use the eraser to target kind of any darker spots, blemishes that I'm seeing. Uh, now, as we come down here, instead of going lighter here, what I'm going to do is go darker and try to find a sharper edge here. So as I, as I look down here, I can sharpen that up a little bit. Kind of pick my way up along there. And now I can add a little bit more precision along this chin. Kind of refine that shape a little bit. And we can see the, the bend, the curve. I want to compare it to the placement of the nose, make sure I'm kind of generally in the right spot. So in terms of creating uh, form and volume, um, it all has to do with how you're managing the edges. So as we come up along that cheek, it really softens. It gets, becomes very difficult to find that edge. It comes, becomes more visible here. Uh, and I can drop in just a light line and see what that does. Maybe darken it just a touch and then feather it out into that background. That edge gets softer here, but picks up again here where the eyebrow kind of wraps around. It's sharper here. And then it becomes more diffused as it blends with that hair. I do want to double check. I have to use my left hand because when I bring my arm around, it covers in front of the screen in front of me and then I can't see. Yeah, I thought so. This has got to slope back some. I'm not going to mess with the hair too much at this point. But I think I, I will try to darken this to, uh, up a bit. Just being mindful of those sharp edges that I was just creating. Also give the blending brush a bit of a try. Let's see what this thing does. Just kind of lightweight, circular marks. See how that blends. It's not really doing a whole lot for this, but I do like the precision it gives me. Similar to the, the blending brush. I mean, the, uh, the blending stump there, the tortillon, but... Um, I like that the brush can really scrub the paper. Oh, the fingerprint just about went away. That was there. Huh. I can use this to soften up some of those edges as well. Um, so much can be stated by um, really paying attention to the edges. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but you know our our understanding of light and shadow um, in our brains, how, our, how we interpret light and shadow, um, has to do with edges. How sharp or diffused an edge is is an indicator of the texture. Um, and if we get the transitions right, then the brain starts to fill in some of that missing information. And so we need less, uh, you know, kind of 
detailed texture marks in a drawing or a painting because we're allowing the user's brain to do some of the work for us. All right, so I think at this point, um, let's see. Um, oh, Deb, uh, Deborah is asking the name. What is it? It's Christy Gordon. So K R I S T Y Gordon. So we've got several courses with her on Artist Network, um, and she also does her own mentoring programs as well. Um, um, and then this month, we're also going to be talking with Gustavo Ramos. Uh, so check out his work as well. All right. So I'm going to actually what I'll do maybe is if I'm going to ignore most of this and I just want to focus on the, the details, what I'll do is try to zoom in a little bit more, perhaps too much. Let me recrop this. Why I want to do that? Huh. That's weird. Okay. Man, that didn't work. I need to. Sorry. Messing with things too much. Um, I'm just trying to zoom in a little bit, but it didn't really do it. So now I'm too far away. There we go. Whew. Um, so let's look at kind of refining now. Um, now that I have basically these shapes mostly refined, I'm going to complete the, I'm going to complete the, really the facial features here. Um, I'm going to start with my harder graphite, my, my kind of medium, uh, and I'm going to save my darkest darks for last. Uh, and I, I want to begin by kind of really thinking of, from, of it from a structural standpoint, thinking about the spaces between the features first rather than the features themselves. Um, and that helps keep me focused on the, again, just kind of building from light and shadow. So what I like to do is, is think in my head that there's nothing inherently different about these features than, than really the whole head or the drawing as a whole. We're just doing it at a smaller scale, right? So if I, I think about the same issues of shadow shapes, edges, etc. I'm going to find that a little bit more, but I, I think I need to kind of lock in that, that eyebrow. I'm going to be thinking through that, that shape. So just with this overhand grip, kind of block in that shape. Softer edges than you might want. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm eyeballing it right now, but as I evaluate where the eyebrow goes, I'm doing some quick check-ins with where I'm at um, relative to other features. As we come up here, kind of move into from the shadow shape into that eyebrow. And what is that shape? I'm trying to think through that. Okay. Now I'll come I'll come back and finish those a bit more later. 
I mostly just needed to get those shapes in there. Now is that, is that an appropriate angle between the eyebrows? I'm going to double check, do some angle sighting. And I feel like I can lift this one up just a little bit more. Now, um, yeah, uh, Greg, I'll try to post a link to that brush uh, when I can. It'll be once after that. Uh, once after the show. Ooh, wrong one. Wrong charcoal. That was a soft one. I could feel it right away. All right, so I'm going to start by squinting my eyes. Try to reestablish the overall shape. And what I see is it interacts with the edge of the nose. So you see kind of the diffusion of that shape here and a sharpening of that shape as we move into that eye socket and it kind of tucks in behind the, the bridge of the nose. So I'm not going to draw a line for that bridge of the nose. I'm just looking at that with regards to the, almost the negative space of the eye. I'm going to try to break the eye down into angles. And I'm doing my best to think of the eye, again, as an abstraction. You know, we start drawing eyes at such an early age that we develop very powerful symbol systems for representing them. And it can be a challenge to break those symbol systems Okay, so I'm going to keep massaging that, but what we see here is if you look at the at the light here at the uh, the top of the eye, that highlight is a little bit brighter. It's you can see that there's a cylindrical structure that's affecting the the shape of the eye there. And there is I'm going to pick up some charcoal here. This kind of falls into shadow underneath the eyelid. But there's just a thin sliver of light that's catching the edge of that eyelid. And when we, when we look at this, the eye socket, it's dark here in the middle. Um, and then it, as it rounds, here it's lighter up top with the light is catching it right here where the eyebrow is. It rolls under where it's a little bit shaded. And then there is some light catching the folds on the eyelids there. And I'll use this sharpened eraser to kind of indicate that. I'll come at it from this way since I couldn't see that edge very well. And I'm going to start with marks using the blending brush, I mean, the blending, the, the tor tortillon in there, the blending stump, because it's a little bit softer and I'll come in and darken it later. Uh, so in here, I know this is going to be, there's going to be the white of the eyes, but before I lighten it, I'm going to darken it with the iris and the pupil. Let um, me get a nice kind of sharp edge here. And we get a fairly sharp edge here on the upper eyelid. It's a slightly diffused edge. So I'm really taking my time. And, and one of the things you can start to see when you look closely at 
at this is because of the angle, we really start to see the volume of the sphere of the eyeball around this edge. Um, we start to see the underside of the, eye, the upper eyelid, and we lose it as we come around to the front of the eye. Um, and I'm going to ignore the eyelashes, and instead I, I see that there's a crease in the eyelid here. And I'm going to intentionally use the overhand grip here to kind of scribe a broken line there. This is one of those things that can age a portrait as if, if you draw those lines too heavy. Now it gets dark in here. I'm going to keep refining this. I'm bouncing all around on purpose um, because I know the longer I stare at something, the more it'll distort. Drop a shadow in here on the eyeball. Blend a little bit here. Soften that edge. It's a, generally a softer edge on the, uh, the edge of the iris there. I don't like what I just did that right there. So I need to... Sculpt a little bit with the eraser. All right, now, before I draw any of the eyelashes in there, I'm gonna work on that shadow shape underneath the eye. And I want to, I'm going to kind of keep refining this edge here a little bit that gets, and ultimately gets obscured by the eyelashes. So if there's, now that there's, there's a little bit more work that I can do here, I don't like that, that blotchiness that I've created there. So I'm going to feather that out. Try to make that transition a little bit more subtle. Be mindful of the direction of the marks as best I can. And use a sharp line to define this edge here. Um, Let's see. Um, uh, Donna is asking about drawing an older person. You know, I've got, I've got a few other videos. Um, I, I don't remember off the top of my head which numbers they are, but you can kind of check on the playlist on our YouTube channel and find uh, one. So there's, I've got a few where there's older subjects. I'm gonna try to capture the age. You know, a little bit more effectively. All right. So just being careful as I blend not to really mess with that edge too much at this point. You know, earlier in the drawing I was totally fine just messing with an edge, but now I'm, I want to be a bit more tentative around them. All right, so now back to the eyelashes. Uh, so we generally the upper eyelashes are heavier, thicker. Um, I, I just spotted something though that you can start to see some reflections on the whites of the eyes. Uh, and I wanna pick up a little bit, maybe I wanna round out the sphere of the eyeball a little bit by lifting off some, but not that sharp edge. 
and I want to get that sharp highlight in there. So I overstated that. And I can come back in and cut that back down. Reestablish that edge. Now with this, um, I wish I could contort my paper, but I have to contort myself. Um, and to draw these, rather than use the tip of the pencil in this tripod get grip, I'm using this overhand grip, placing it at the starting point, identifying the angle, and then kind of flicking upward. And I need to refine this a little bit more. Looking at that negative space in the whites of the eye. And now looking at doing the same kind of technique here for the, the lower eyelashes. And I don't like how flat it, it's gotten right in here. That shape isn't quite right. Uh, so I'm going to kind of work that a little bit. So there's, you can see that there's quite a bit of working that needs to happen, a lot of back and forth. Um, also, here we see a, if we are looking at value relationships, there's a, a, a bright spot here in the center of the eye where it's turning a corner and at the top of the, the sphere here of the eyeball. All right, now I can refine this edge a little bit again. Whew. Now, as I look down in here, I'm gonna just put some rough indications for the nose, but I'm not gonna draw that yet. Um, what I'm primarily looking at, though, is the negative space, this shape in here. Um, and I find that that helps me to a arrive at a more accurate shape. So I'm, since I'm not drawing the nose, again, I'm overriding that symbol system. I'm drawing the negative space around it. Um, but I'm going to come over here. I'm going to first, again, do another take of the, the angle, the axis of the eyes. And I think I'm pretty, pretty well established here. So find the angle that the inside corners of the eyes are. I'm just going to put a little dot there to remind myself of where I'm at. Um, and, and now I'm going to move up to the, again, the space around the eye. I'm going to build my way into it rather than starting with the eye and feathering out towards the edge. If you're new, if you're just joining us, what you're watching is Drawing Together. So every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, we get together to draw together. Uh, my name's Scott Meyer. This is I'm with Artist Network. Um, we choose a new subject each week designed to help us advance our skills in particular ways. All right. Um, thinking through the overall structure around the eye. But before I get into that, this is a really delicate area, so I'm going to switch to the, the torchy on here. Um, and I'm not, I'm just thinking about really establishing the environment for the eye. Uh, and I want to kind of restate that this is simply my process for today. Um, I might tackle a 
portrait drawing in a different way at you know at a different time. Um, and this isn't necessarily the way to do it. This is just how I do it and how I'm choosing to do it today and seeing what it can teach me about the head, about charcoal, about light and shadow, all of those fun things. So what I'm, again, as I keep my eyes squinted, I'm trying to just see the transition and try to see the overall shadow shape, uh, the shape of the head in which the eyes sit. Right now it looks kind of weird. Um, all right, thank you for the comments. Yeah, this, this eyebrow needs to be higher as well. I, I agree. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish, I'm going to keep working on this eye over here and then I think come back to that. Um, what I'm, what I'm kind of getting caught between is looking at this directly where I'm at this angle and I'm compensating for the perspective of the drawing and then looking at the screen in front of me that captures the overhead camera um, and that is, that is seeing it without that perspective distortion and um, I need to be relying on that overhead camera more. Yeah, okay. But those are all good observations. Keep them coming. That's why we're drawing together. And it's not just watch me draw. All right. So what is really striking is the angle of her left eye. It's like on, on the right side of the drawing. And it, it's got a fairly steep angle. I'm just going to kind of lightly indicate that axis. Um, and, and part of that is just the shadows of the eyelashes kind of obscuring this upper eyelid. All right, so as I'm, how do I want to do this? I think I want to, I want to start with the, the iris here. Going to keep my eyes squinted. Um, I want to be thinking about this shadow. Again, the, the eye is a ball, so we see a highlight here transitioning into the shadow. And I'm thinking about that overall shape. Keep squinting my eyes to see that shape as a whole before I add any sort of detail or refinement. Uh, but I think I'm... I think I can sharpen that edge. And then I can sharpen this, that shadow on that lower eyelid. And you can see a thin light line that represents the thickness of that lower eyelid. Um, and I should be using my blending stump for that because again, it's just more gentle. You can see in that shadow, there's a cast shadow of those eyelashes. All right, now I'm going to, have to contort myself again. Kind of lock on this angle here where the light's catching the inside eyelid, the lower eyelid. The light's catching right in here. So generally, the, the light catches, it is most visible, uh, kind of the apex and the, the outer turns and the inner turns. She looks very surprised there. Um, so I think I, now I can try to cap, close this gap here. Again, try to find that angle. And this upper line here is, it's, it, it could be softer than you might think. 
uh, in that what you're actually seeing is the shadow, the form shadow on the underside of the eyelid plus the cast shadow that eyelid is casting onto the whites of the eye. Um, this being a ball, the light is catching a little bit stronger on this side of the eyeball. Um, I think I need to bring the iris over a little bit. It's a little bit darker right in here in those kind of tear ducts. And yeah, I think that's a kind of a sharp enough eraser. Uh, so here the light is a little bit stronger as well. And then the light really catches right here in the corner of the eye nicely. And I'm going to use kind of the broad edge of that um, the eraser, kind of like a brush, kind of swiping down. A build up tone down in here because again I want to be mindful of where the highlights are the strongest which is right in this area here all right so now I can come back in and darken this area even more increase the contrast um, find some subtle variations in this shadow side I need to kind of really lock onto the shape of the nose as I come down the, the bridge there. Um, and maybe what I want to do is finish the eyebrows. And I think I, this is where I can bring this eyebrow up a little bit more. And then it really, as it wraps around that edge, really kind of cuts down there. And then I need to raise it here. So I think that that feels a little bit better. I want to refine the shape of this eyebrow. Um, and to get those the texture there, I'm just going to use the, the side of the, the pencil and kind of drag it along. You can see what sharp edges they make. And I find that that technique works really well for hair and for eyelashes things like that. Now, and now I'm coming back around here to finish off this eye. Um, and one of the reasons I needed to kind of take that diversion moving into the eyebrows is just to kind of come back to the eyes with a degree of freshness. I can look at them again. And that's why I try not to get too locked in to one particular area. Uh, I'm going to use, again, that, that overhand kind of grip. And one of the things that could be helpful is to really think about those eyelashes coming out horizontally and then up, not coming straight up, um, and trying to, um, uh, trying to reinforce the structure of the eye through that um, and trying to, to look at the variations as well so that, um, you know, there, there is not a kind of a rhythmic indication of those, those eyelashes. They're, they're not evenly spaced. They clump together in interesting ways and they change angles. And uh, so as we look in here, what's difficult to see is sort of the division between the eyelashes and the eyeball. 
So again, I, I lifted off that highlight in the eye, but I overstated it, and I can just cut that back down a little bit. some really kind of interesting shadows falling on the whites of the eyes. So it's getting kind of minute, but... Uh, Daniel is saying, is, is this charcoal? It is charcoal, yep. Um, welcome back, Jane. The outer corner of the model's left eye is lower than in the photo. Yeah, I think it could be, yeah. So there might be some things that are kind of slightly off. I'm going to keep moving but keep those observations coming because then I may be able to get back to them. Um, I might have to just make a decision about what I'm able to address within a certain time limit here. I'm um, going to have a little bit more depth to some of these curves here. So I think one of the challenges to portrait drawing is that, you know, we as humans are so finely attuned to subtle expressions, um, we were, it, it's so much a, a, an instinct that has been, you know, evolved over, you know, many, many generations to, to look at other humans um, and understand their expressions. Um, and as a result, we just become hypersensitive to that and that can make us hypersensitive to portraits as well. We, we're again, we, uh, the, the slightest change to the angle of an eye or, or um, you know, the the tilt or the angle of the mouth can um, you know change the overall understanding of that that person entirely. So. There is a, you know, I think it, 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 for me, it just really does take practice. Um, and kind of sensitivity to the, you know, very kind of th the small things in a way that it may be less critical in things like a still life or a, uh, or a landscape. Um, all right, before I get into the nose, I'm just going to take some time to build up additional value in this shadow side here. Maybe refine this edge. Um, and that's to help um, kind of, I don't know, make the, the contrast in the eyes a little bit more accepted. <laughs> right now, they're, they're really jumping off the page. So I'm going to drop some of the values here. Um, and so with the hair, um, I like to and do a lot of this overhand grip with these short kind of directional marks following the grain of the hair. And then notice how, you know, this side of the hair is in light, this is in shadow. And so even though we understand her hair to be very dark, there is that contrast um, between light and shadow as well. Um, and we're kind of compensating for that in our minds uh, because we, you know, there's a, there's the literal value and then there's the optical value. There's a literal truth and the optical truth. And we're constantly battling that in our artwork when we're, when we're working from life. There's what we know to be true about the object and then there's what we can actually see. And a lot of times those aren't the two, they aren't the same. So we know, for example, that the hair is, the literal truth is that it's all one value. The optical truth is that it's actually lighter here because it's being struck by light. Um, uh, Daniel is saying, how is it possible that you don't brush over the charcoal and keep the lines that sharp? I sometimes struggle with this even in graphite. Um, it's not comfortable to hold up your hand all the time. Oh, I see. Like, you can see my hand's getting all messy. I'm really picking up a lot of charcoal here, and I'm kind of working from left to right, knowing that I'm going to have to reestablish some of these areas. I, I can't, for the life of me, keep my hands clean and keep edges clean. Um, 
you know, so I try to build everything up all at once. But when I get to kind of the final details, I may start in, on the left and end to the right. Um, okay, now this helps to just expand the value range in the drawing as a whole. Uh, so I can, um, I want to think about where the, the shadow core is. So the shadow core is the darkest part in a form shadow. And it's often at, it's not at the edge, it's often just inside the edge. Uh, let's see here. Um, and the, kind of back to Stephanie's observation about the depth between the eyebrow, you know, the eye in the in the ear, that that angle difference there. Um, pay attention really to the subtle changes in value and that transition between them. So it's a um, you know we're going back in space here, and we can see there's a variation of a little bit darker, slightly lighter, darker again, and then light catching on the ear. All right, now the nose, I'm going to get back to this. Um, so similar to where it worked over here, you know, I'm going to be thinking about that negative space as I'm literally drawing the nose uh, because it helps me to keep that abstraction. Um, I want to see that edge of the nose. The edge of the nose is really a vertical line here. There's some subtle shift. Um, oof, almost dropped my pencil and that would have been a broken point for sure. A little bit darker as it turns that edge there and follows up along the bridge of the nose. It's kind of darker in here. The highlight is right here, kind of where I put that. There's this little smudge right now, so I need to get rid of that. And then reshape it. All right. So as I as I look at the nose here, I'm gonna, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll actually start from this center outward. You can see a shadow core kind of right in here, really soft edges. Um, we see a shadow core here. And I'll try to talk through the, the complex structure that is a nose and trying to see the planes. And so the, the, the attention to edges is really critical here. Um, so we see a soft edge right in here, for example, as we wrap around into that nostril. Um, it gets a little bit sharper right in here where that nostril is behind and then the front part of the underside of the nose overlaps it. We're going back in space here. Um, and it gets a little bit darker as we go back here. There's some reflected light bouncing up there. And so there's kind of a structure to it. Um, now, if we look at this this nostril again, it um, this kind of wraps around underneath and then kind of tucks back in, um, and so it's a little bit softer. So it's harder at the it's a harder edge at the top of the nostril, but softer underneath as it falls down under here. And then there's a shadow. Let's see how I want to do this. Let's see. I want to check in where I am relative to the eyes and the nose. So this is all in shadow, but we see a bit of a cast shadow here. That's what I'm rendering. A little bit sharper against this inside edge, a little bit more diffused around the outer edge. It comes in and it kind of ticks down 
word. And, and then I'm going to actually move over here. There's light hitting this plane here. It comes in under, and then there's this little cast shadow here. You can see the light catching on the ridges there. Under here, though, it gets darker again. It's like a, a shadow core. It wraps around up into that nostril. Just going to kind of wash over that, put all of this in shadow again, and darken the whole thing over here. And you can see there's a structure to the nose that is indicated by this kind of broken shadow form. It's not one shadow that runs here. It's There's this shadow here on the inside of the eye socket, and it changes direction here where the bone is a little bit closer to the skin, and that kind of points right towards the center of the, of the tip of the nose. And then kind of the fleshy part on the tip of the nose is indicated by these subtle values here. And then this gets soft in here, wrapping down into the, uh, the nostril. Now, actually, I want to pick this back up again. Now, looking at this shape, I want to smooth this out a bit. Keep that all in shadow, but to, to kind of create more form in the nostril, you'll see like a smaller shadow core right in there with a little bounce light coming up to the left of it, to the right of it, I mean. Now, if we look at this nostril, you can really see how, sorry, I'm saying the word nostril so much. That's kind of a weird word. But um, you can really see how it wraps around. You look at the complex compound curves of this. It's not an oval that we're drawing there. It's a series of short straight marks. And really try to look at that structure. That highlight is there. I want to get a little bit more lifted here at the on the bridge of the nose where the light is turning here and here all right and then i want to bring this shadow down right in here a little bit more leading us right to the nose i mean right to the mouth there um, And then you know, remember what I mentioned earlier about the fall off here where you have light and the light is much um, less intense as it encounters the mouth and the chin. Um, but what I, as, I, as I think about that, I want to be looking at the, the changing planes here as we move across the, the lower cheek there and then we come down and around the lips and just sculpt with the, the blending stump a little bit. All right, so now with the mouth, you know, similar approach as we took, as we've taken so far with the whole of the drawing, I want to be refining the overall shape. Uh, and so I'm looking at it in comparison to the nose, orienting myself to that, squinting my eyes, and I'm not trying to think about it as a mouth. I'm just trying to think about it as a shape. 
um, and she's got a very kind of non-symmetrical, asymmetrical um, mouth structure here just because of her expression and the three-quarter turn. Start thinking about that shadow underneath the lower lip. Uh, and I want to kind of indicate where the corner of the mouth will be relative to the eye. So it's kind of directly underneath the tear ducts there. Um, and then this corner is over here. I want to double check the angle between the two corners of the mouths of the mouth. Maybe br this might come up just a little bit. Now, the the thing about lips is that again, it's just like the other features where there's uh, when you look at the edges, it can really help to pull this thing together. Uh, so now, as I'm thinking through this overall structure. You know, look at how soft that edge is in the reference photo. Maybe I'll bring out the brush to do this with. And I'm, I, I'm intentionally starting with it being softer than I might want it to be in the end, and I'll sharpen it up as I go. And the benefit to that is it helps to really anchor the form to the to the head, you know, one of the, the things I want to try to avoid is this kind of Mr. Potato Head look where it feels like the features are just kind of pasted on, they're just kind of stuck onto the head there. Um, I'm going to do some subtractive drawing by um, kind of erasing the form, but I'm not going to that bright white And we see in that corner of the mouth how that gets really, really soft as well. Um, this can come over here. All right, so now I'm going to be thinking kind of from the center of the, the mouth forward, you know, outward, I mean. So as we look over here, it's really a kind of a compressed shape because it's wrapped around the the head so we can see very little of this lip but we're what we're doing is we're looking at the underside of it um, and then it it starts to wrap around the corner so we have this kind of pad here in the front of the lips um, here it's a shelf that cuts back towards the teeth and we see the bottom side of the lips there it gets kind of darker right in here And then we have here, what's happening is that lower lip is in front of that, um, in, in front of the teeth back there. So we're trying to push this part back and bring this edge forward. And let's see, I wanna be thinking through how we have a shadow under here that kind of breaks into two as it moves up here towards the corner of the mouth. It's catching the light in there, so I'll have to lift that off. And then the chin, because of the three-quarter view, again, is not symmetrical. There's kind of a sharper edge right in here. And I think I need to even darken this again. And really try to create that transition. Uh, before I do that though, I think I need to lift, I'm gonna use the kneaded eraser, I'm gonna lift this highlight right in there. It didn't work so well.
And there's really that soft transition from that, that light into this shadow. Nice shadow pour there. And then what we see is a little bit of light catching right along here. So what, I, what I'd like to envision is the light kind of catching along this, that whole kind of curve that, that spans the, this part of the cheek and the lip, right? I'm not, I'm not breaking apart kind of the red part of the lip from the rest of kind of the fleshy part. And now I can, what I can do is add a little bit of detail. And I think what I'll need to do actually is lift off the light here. And that'll be the highlights. And I have to kind of fill in some of the space around it. And notice that the highlights along the lip aren't at the top edge. They're right in the middle. It actually turns a little bit darker. Um, as we as we round that. I'm going to use my blending stump just kind of darken along that that top plane of the lower lip, along the the kind of the turning plane, and leaving the highlights there on the the front plane. And now I'm going to bring out some of the darkness here in the corners, leading up to the corner of the mouth. And again, just trying to keep sharpening that lip, give it a little bit more definition. And then I can come in here, there's a little bit of a highlight that's pretty intense right here catching the top of the lip. And as I kind of refine that edge, rather than draw a line along the top of the lip, it's just a series of these vertical marks that find that path. Um, and I got a, I have, something else I need to start, I need to get to, so I have to end this pretty quickly because it's already after three o'clock, um, but I wanted to get through some of these major features and I think I can start to wrap things up pretty quickly. Um, I do want to give a little bit more dimension around the lips here to the structure of that, and I think we need to go darker with the, the shadow core here. So really trying to find the area in the cheek where it's the darkest value. And I haven't even used the, the soft charcoal, and I'm not sure if I really need it for this. Um, you know, if, and for the ear, as you're getting in there, you know, I, I have this, this initial value established, and I'm going to leave that for the lights, and then darken the darker areas here of that ear um, to try to find that, find that structure. And there's a little bit of light catching that ear. If I just tap with the kneaded eraser here, it starts to lift that. Um, but the, the when I it's not going to really be complete here until I uh, until I really indicate that chin line. And so the the key here is that we talked earlier about that bounce light underneath the chin. Um, what I want to do is find that angle for the jaw line and it's darker underneath it. And you can see the turn right up here. 
You might need to angle sight that to get the, the right angle. But you can see by simply darkening the space around that area, it creates the impression of that bounce light. So I didn't have to lift anything. I just built it by darkening the area around it. Um, and now what we see here is this really beautiful transition where the, we have this nice kind of dark edge uh, that rolls into the shadow around the chin. It's that turning edge. And as we move up, that shadow shifts in from the edge of that jawline. So that we got that jawline there. This shadow starts to step in and leave a little bit of that light space where the bounce light is. And so then the shadow core um, along the, the jawline it comes in like this. And one of the, the things that can sometimes happen is to overstate that bounce light. So just double check that. And it should, it should disappear when you squint at your drawing. And if it does that, then you, you know you've kind of found an effective value balance. Um, yeah, Stephanie, I love that Sargent quote of that. A portrait is a painting with something wrong with the mouth. <laughs> yeah, it's always tricky. So there, there are things here that I'm going to need to continue to correct, but I do have to, I have to move on to other things throughout the day here. Hopefully this has given you something to, to really work with as you complete your own portraits, um, you know, especially if you want to move on to complete the rest of the, the drawing. But I, um, I wanted to make sure that we really account for the main structure is here. Um, and if you wanted to even just give a light indication of kind of the shadow forms here, you can do that. But um, yeah, I should. But I think I think for now, this is probably as, as good of a place to stop for the day as, as any. So, um, oh, that really darkened it up. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, next week, uh, I saw a question about that. Next week, we'll be working on another in the Art of the Steel series, so master copies. And I found a, um, a Rubens drawing of a lion uh, that I will be doing. And um, what I'm actually doing is toning the paper. And I'm going to work on a video for that to show you how to do that in advance of it. So take a, keep a look out. I'll be posting that to YouTube uh, as soon as it's ready. I'm still kind of experimenting with that process, so um, I want to make sure that I, you know, when I post the video that it, it's something that you could replicate pretty easily. Um, so I'm going to tone the paper for that, and that will be a, a really fun drawing next week. So check back for that. Again, this is Drawing Together. We meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. So I hope that if you're new, that you'll join us again. Be sure to share your own drawings on the link to the show page in the description below. Uh, and everybody have a fantastic week. Um, it has been a pleasure drawing with you all today.